a great salvation wrought upon the atoning tree. The fourteenth station, Jesus, is laid in the sepulchre. We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee. Because by thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. The body of her dearly beloved son is taken from his mother and laid by the disciples in the tomb. The tomb is closed, and there the lifeless body remains until the hour of its glorious resurrection. We too, O God, will descend into the grave whenever it shall please thee, as it shall please thee, and wheresoever it please thee. Suffer our sinful bodies to return to their parent dust, but do thou, in thy great mercy, receive our mortal souls, and when our bodies are risen again, place them likewise in thy kingdom, that we may love and bless thee forever and ever. Amen. Amen. O God, we, we love thee with our whole hearts and above all things, and are heartily sorry that we have offended thee. May we never offend thee any more. O oh, may we love thee without ceasing, and, and make it our delight to do in all things thy most holy will. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have, Have mercy upon us. May the souls of the faithful through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. To my parting soul be given entrance at the gate of heaven and in Came obedient unto death for us, even the death of the cross. Let us pray. Almighty God, we beseech thee graciously to behold this thy family for which our Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Does time heal all pain? I'd like to tell you a story. October 21st, 2009 is a day that I will always remember. I was living in Chicago with my sister at that time having taken a sabbatical from my ministry. And to make some extra money, I was working at the men's, the men's counter at Macy's, the men's department. And as I was working, somebody from the office came to see me and said, uh, Andy, uh, you need to call your brother right away. And so I immediately thought, Oh, I wonder if something's going on with my mother, because uh, my brother was taking care of my mother at the time. So I called him, and he answered the phone, and he said, Andy, you need to get down to this hospital in Chicago right away. And I wondered what could be going on. And so as I drove down there, I was thinking in my mind, wonder what's happened. And then my sister called, and she asked me, are you on your way? I said, yes. And she said to me, uh, something's happened to Liza. And Liza is my sister's oldest daughter. She is 20 years old at the time. And I had just spent uh, the evening with her the night before, having gone downtown to see her and to deliver her car with it, to her. And we had a, just a marvelous evening. She showed me her apartment. and. Uh, we listened to some tunes and generally just had a wonderful time together. And so I wondered, as I headed towards the hospital, what could have possibly have happened. So I arrived at the hospital, and there I found my sister, Cecilia, and she came up to me and she whispered in my ear, 
Liza's gone. It turned out that Liza, as she so often did, was riding her bike in downtown Chicago where she lived. Uh, she was riding from her job to her apartment and when she approached a stop sign to stop, she lost her balance and she fell and then she was struck by a vehicle and she died instantly. And so as we were waiting there for a few minutes, the chaplain came in and said to my sister and I, do you want to come and see Liza now? And Cecilia grabbed onto my hand and it was like a, an iron grip. She grabbed onto it and she didn't want to go forward. But I said, Cecilia, come on, we can do this. I said, Jesus is with us. And so we walked in there and we saw Liza's broken body and my sister Cecilia came and said in a soft voice, my poor Liza. And she knelt down and began to grieve, weep silently. She didn't cry out, it was very quiet. And all I could think of at that time was that there had been many times as a priest where I'd gone with grieving families and been with deceased persons, but this was so different. All I could remember was those words from Jeremiah 31, 15. A voice is heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And so events followed in rapid succession. We had the funeral, and many of our family came, and it was a great comfort to have them there. But I could tell Cecilia, she was in another world. She was not fully present, except to grieve. And one of the things I noticed um, Cecilia had on her refrigerator was a calendar and it's one of those whiteboard calendars you know that you can wipe off at the end of each month and then you put in the next month and the days on the month and you record all of the different you know events that you're going to do that month and of course the calendar for that month read October 2009 and then I found that as the days passed into weeks and the weeks Passed in the months, the calendar never changed. It stayed the same. My sister never erased it, didn't replace it with November, December, January, but just kept it at October of 2009. Later that summer, in the late summer of 2010, I left Chicago and came to Grand Prairie, Texas to be the priest at St. Andrew's Church at Grand Prairie. But on the first anniversary, I went back up there to Chicago to see my sister, to be with her on the anniversary of Liza's passing. And I saw the calendar, and once again, it was still October 2009, still unchanged as it had been on that day that Liza died. And I made it a point to go see Cecilia at least once a year, every year, for several years. And each year that I went up there, I saw the calendar, and it was the same, and it read October 2009. It was as if time itself had come to a halt, and all that we could remember was that that day was forever etched in our history and in our minds and in our hearts and we couldn't get past it as if we lived eternally in October 21st, 2009. I remember Cecilia grieving at every anniversary, Liza's birthday, 
Liza's passing at Christmas and at Easter. All of these occasions were opportunities for her to remember. And another frequent part of her grieving process was that a bunch of Liza's friends uh, bought a bike because Liza was very fond of bicycling and they painted the bicycle white and they fastened it to the lamppost at the intersection where Liza had died. And it became like a memorial for her and my sister would always go down there to visit and to remember. And this was a process that went on for several years. Well then finally, uh, just this past Christmas in October, in December of 2019, I went to visit Cecilia again and I saw the calendar. And I saw something that I didn't quite expect. I saw that the calendar had changed. It was no longer October of 2009, it was now December 2019. And what struck me then was that something had happened, that my sister had changed. I wouldn't say that she'd been healed, but something else, I think, deeper and more profound had taken place. Now there is a saying and you've probably all heard it, and it goes something like, time heals all wounds. Well, if that's true, I don't see any evidence for it. There's no evidence for it in the scriptures. I don't see any evidence of it from the life of Jesus. Instead, what I see throughout the scriptures is that people who are in pain, people who needed healing, they needed a touch from God. And I can remember Jesus' encounter, for example, with the man lying near the pool of Bethesda. Said that he'd been lying there for 40 years, and whenever he tried, it seemed to dip his foot into the pool to get in there, he never made it. And it was Jesus who healed him. I remember the story of the man who had been born blind. He was now a man approaching middle age when he encountered Jesus, and Jesus restored his sight. Or the various other people who encountered Jesus, they had suffered for a long time, but it wasn't time that healed their wounds, it was an encounter with the living God, with Jesus, that healed them. As I think back on my sister's process, her grief, it wasn't time that brought her healing. It wasn't time that changed her perspective. It was, as it says in Matthew 5, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It was my sister Cecilia's ability to mourn that helped her, that changed her. You see, Cecilia didn't run away from her pain. She embraced it. She embraced it every opportunity that she could. She always took the opportunity to remember Liza, to think about her, to talk about her, and to share stories of her with her friends and her family. And I believe that there was this that helped Cecilia survive and continue to live her life. And not only that, she pressed into her relationship with the Lord. She pressed in. She worshipped God. She sought to draw closer to Him. There were days when she was angry. There were days when she couldn't even get out of bed because she felt so bad. But she never gave in to despair. Yes, she grieved, she wept, but she never gave in to despair. She always kept moving closer to God. 
And God started doing something wonderful in her because you see, she began to use Cecilia as his instrument to heal others. And I can think of so many people whose lives Cecilia has touched as she now has her own ministry to women and to people who seek God. And Jesus uses her in so many wonderful ways. And my sister has developed such a depth of compassion and love for others. She didn't give in to despair, to bitterness. She hasn't become cynical and angry. On the contrary, she is more loving and more compassionate than perhaps any person I know. So I believe that what happened with her, it's not that she was healed, it's that she was comforted. The scriptures tell us that the true healing will ultimately come for all of us when we pass from this life into eternity. And on Liza's anniversary, you might say her 10th anniversary of her passing last October, I sent my sister some flowers. And on the note, I included a Bible verse, and it was from Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8. And it goes like this, He will destroy death forever. The Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. I believe that that's the reality that we have to look forward to. When we cross from this life into eternity, when we see Jesus face to face, it is then, my friends, that we will experience the true healing and the true restoration. Because you see, he is gonna come and he's gonna wipe away every tear. And he's gonna take away those things that have caused us pain. And then we will begin to see him face to face and to know his love and his goodness. My friends, that's what we have to look forward to. In the meantime, as we continue our pilgrimage here on earth, we have the grace and the blessedness to know his comfort as we not run away from the things that cause us pain, but as we press into them, as we mourn our hurts and our sorrows, as we give them to him, as we seek his face, as we rely on him, it is then, my friends, that we begin to become ourselves, that we begin to become whole, so that on the last day when we do see him, we will be made complete and whole. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.